Hi, welcome to your first lesson for our new novel, which is called A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline LaAngle. You probably have a copy that looks like this. I have another copy of my book, which I may be reading from sometimes, which looks like this. Um, hopefully we've had some time in class to talk about the covers of the book, what you notice in the pictures, and make some predictions as to what you think the book will be about. So I'm not going to take the time in this video to do that but take a look at your book and think about those things if we haven't already talked about them. Um, you may be aware that there was a new movie for this book not that long ago, just a few years ago, a new movie came out. I want to caution you that it is not really exactly like the book. So we need to read to do well um, on our activities for the book. You're not going to be able to base it completely on the movie. So please stay with me, watch my videos. I'm gonna help you as we go through it because especially in the beginning, it's a little challenging to follow. Um, you should have received a worksheet from me during class time um, for chapter one notes before you begin this. And it looks like this that you see on fr in front of you. So I want you to take a minute. First of all, it tells you to use your interactive notes to complete the blanks for the de definitions below. So I have my interactive notebook handy where we created our plot pyramid. And we see first exposition, which is the very first line, the first flap that we have here. And the defi definition doesn't match perfectly. On our notes, the definition says the first part of the plot, characters, setting, and basic situations are revealed. So now we're gonna take that information and fill in our blanks. The exposition occurs at the beginning of the story. This first part would be the beginning. It blank, the characters blank and blank. And we don't have a word quite like that, so we're gonna fill in, it introduces the characters, and now we can take a look, what else is there? Setting, and either ba basic situation, although I also like the idea of conflict, as we get into that inciting incident, which a lot of times is in our exposition, that introduces our conflict. So if we could fill in those blanks there. As we read chapter one, we are getting into the exposition and the exposition introduces many of our characters. Uh, we do start to kind of learn the conflict, but we get that a little bit more as we continue in the book. I've decided to include our vocabulary words on our worksheet only. Um, I don't wanna completely drop vocabulary, so take a look at the three words that are pretty challenging as we start to read our book here, and um, they're gonna show up over and over again. So it's pretty important that you understand them. We see the word indignantly, serenity, we'll see a lot of forms of that. We'll see the word serene, serenely, and then in this chapter we see serenity. So it's just the different part of speech, the way it's used, but the meaning pretty much stays the same. And the third word is sullen. So as we're reading, I will pause. Oh, we found that, that word, please write down the page number. And if I don't give you a definition in the video, you need to make sure that you go look it up. If I give you the definition, you're welcome to take my version of the definition. As I scroll down here, the next part is um, the characters. In the boxes below, identify the characters as they are introduced, include the page number where they are introduced, and brief briefly describe what each character may look like and some of his or her characteristics. There are several boxes. They even continue on to the next page. We have lots of characters in the first chapter. One, two, three, four, five, six, at least, that we need to fill out. We also see setting is the blank and blank of the story. And I don't think that we actually have this written down in our notes yet. I do believe it's on a poster behind me, which I doubt you can read. Maybe if I um, stop sharing for a minute, you'll be able to see the poster better. Um, it's the one right over my, my shoulder um, where we see a, a sun and a clock. And that our definition, we're gonna fill in it is the time and place of a story. I'm gonna hold off on anything else that's on our worksheet because we probably won't get through it in this lesson. I have a feeling this will take us um, a few videos worth to get through. So please get your book out. Let's 
turn to the beginning of chapter one, which is called Mrs. What's It? Hmm, that's a goofy name. I love this cheesy beginning. It was a dark and stormy night, and it was. Let's read about it. In her attic bedroom, Margaret Murray, wrapped in an old patchwork quilt, sat on the foot of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashing of the wind. Behind the trees, clouds scudded frantically across the sky. Every few, few moments, the moon ripped through them, creating wraith-like shadows that raced along the ground. The house shook. Wrapped in her quilt, Meg shook. She wasn't usually afraid of weather. It's not just the weather, she thought. It's the weather on top of everything else. On top of me. On top of Meg Murray doing everything wrong. School. School was all wrong. She'd been dropped down to the lowest section in her grade. That morning, one of her teachers had said crossly, Really, Meg? I don't understand how a child with parents as brilliant as yours are supposed to be can be such a poor student. If you don't manage to do a little better, you'll have to stay back next year. During lunch, she'd roughhoused a little to try to make herself feel better, and one of the girls said scornfully, after all, Meg, we aren't in grammar school, or we aren't grammar school kids anymore. Why do you always act like such a baby? And on the way home from school, walking up the road with her arms full of books, one of the boys had said something about her dumb baby brother. At this, she'd thrown the books on the side of the road and tackled him with every ounce of strength she had, and arrived home with her blouse torn and a big bruise under one eye. Sandy and Denny's, her 10-year-old twin brothers who got home from school an hour earlier than she did, were disgusted. Let us do the fighting when it's necessary, they told her. A delinquent, that's what I am, she thought grimly. That's what they'll be saying next, not mother, but them, everybody else. I wish father, and then it pauses. But it was not possible to think about her father without the danger of tears. Only her mother could talk about him in a natural way, saying, when your father gets back. All right, I know we're only two pages in. I'm going to stop us a couple of times. Uh, let's take a look at that paper we were just looking at with our characters because we have already met a few. Um, so I'm going to type in mine. Hopefully you can see this. We have met Margaret Murray. Did I spell it right? Yes. Nope, I always do that. I give it a Y. It's just M-R-R-Y. And she's on the very first page. If you are in this book with me, that is page seven. I'm going to have you fill in the details about the character. They don't have to come only from page seven. That's when she's first introduced. Um, as we get into page eight, though, we did get the information about um, her twin brothers, so we have Sandy, and a, that is a boy, Sandy. And I, I never really am sure exactly how to pronounce his name, um, Denny's or Dennis. Um, and I think there are actually two movies. I think they pronounce them differently in the movies. I tend to call him Denny's, like the restaurant, <laughs> um, because of the why, I think. All right, so we did get a little bit in for, we know that they're 10-year-old um, twins. So I would make sure that you would include that. Um, and then any other descriptions that we might get regarding those boys. All right, let's go back to our chapter. So we're on page eight. Get back from where? So we're talking about father again. We're not gonna put mother and father down just yet because we haven't actually met them. Actually, I want to point out one other thing about this. So remember that the very first line was, it was a dark and stormy night. Um, Meg is in her bed during this terrible storm, remembering things of the day. So that is like a, or it would be a flashback. That's also over my shoulder, right underneath uh, our setting. And we see the definition for flashback. Hints or clues, no, that's foreshadowing. 
flashback is underneath foreshadowing. Um, this one here, I don't know if you can read that or not, so I'm gonna hop up. Um, the author interprets the plot of the story, or interrupts, the author interrupts the plot of the story to recreate an event from the earlier time. So it's not, we're not actually transported back into time, but we're, she's remembering it. So it's very similar to a flashback where she's um, reminiscing about the events of the day. All right, back to talking about father. Get back from where and when? Surely her mother must know what people were saying, must be aware of the smugly, vicious gossip. Surely it must hurt her as it did Meg. But if it did, she gave no outward sign. Nothing ruffled the serenity of her expression. So there is our first um, vocabulary word. I don't think it was the first one on our list, but make sure that you note that serenity is on page nine on your worksheet right now. And let's think about it. So the mother gives no outward sign that anything is bothering her that the father is missing. Nothing ruffled her serenity, her calm, her exp the, the calmness of her expression. Look up a better definition than that though, see what you can find. Why can't I hide it too, Meg thought. Why do I always have to show everything? The window rattled madly in the wind and she pulled the quilt close about her. Curled up on one of her pillows, a gray fluff of a kitten yawned, showing its pink tongue, tucked its head on, under again, and went back to sleep. Everybody was asleep, everybody except Meg, even Charles Wallace, the dumb baby brother, who had an uncanny way of knowing when she was awake and unhappy, and who would come so many nights tiptoeing up the attic stairs to her. Even Charles Wallace was asleep. So I would say that we're introduced to this character. We're gonna meet him more in chapter one in a minute, but he's first mentioned on page nine. So we had the twin brothers, and now we have Charles Wallace, record him in the third box, who is introduced on page nine. You can put that quote, dumb baby brother. And as we continue, perhaps read a little bit more, there is a major reason why that's in quotation marks. And you'll find out why. How could they sleep? All day on the radio, there had been hurricane warnings. How could they leave her up in the attic in the rickety brass bed, knowing that the roof might be blown off the house and she tossed out into the wild night sky to land who knows where? Her shivering grew uncontrollable. You asked to have the attic bedroom, she told herself savagely. Mother let you have it because you're the oldest. It's a privilege, not a punishment. Not during a hurricane, it isn't a privilege, she said aloud. She tossed the quilt down on the foot of the bed and stood up. The kitten stretched luxuriously and looked up at her with huge, innocent eyes. Go back to sleep, Mike said. Just be glad you're a kitten and not a monster like me. She looked at herself in the wardrobe mirror and made a horrible face, barring a mouthful of teeth covered with braces. Automatically, she pushed her glasses into position, ran her fingers through her mouse brown hair so that it stood wildly on end, and then let out a sigh, almost as noisy as the wind. That paragraph is kind of a good description of how she appears right now. You can include that in the box for details and perhaps even add in the page number 10 so you know where it came from. The wide wooden floorboards were cold against her feet. Wind blew in the crevices about the window frame. In spite of the protection the storm sash was supposed to offer, she could hear wind howling in the chimneys. From all the way downstairs, she could hear Fordenbraugh, the big black dog, starting to bark. He must be frightened too. What was he barking at? Fordenbraugh never barked without reason. Some people like to include the dog. He's not a major character. You certainly could put him down if you want. He's a big black dog. Suddenly, she remembered that when she had gone to the post office to pick up the mail, she'd heard about a tramp who was supposed to have stolen 12 sheets from Mrs. Buncombe, the constable's wife. They hadn't caught him, and maybe he was headed for the Murray's house right now, isolated on a back road as it was, and the this time, maybe he'd be after more than sheets. Meg hadn't paid much attention to the talk about the tramp at the time because the post mistress, mistress with a sugary smile, had asked if she'd heard from her father lately. 
she left her little room and made her way through the shadows of the main attic, bumping against the ping pong table. Now I'll have a bruise on my hip on top of everything else, she thought. Next, she walked into her old doll's house, Charles Wallace's rocking horse, the twins' electric trains. Why must everything happen to me? She demanded of a large teddy bear. At the foot of the attic stairs, she stood still and listened. Not a sound from Charles Wallace's room on the right. On the left, in her parents' room, not a rustle from her mother sleeping alone in the great double bed. She tiptoed down the hall and into the twins' room, pushing again at her glasses as though they could help her to see better in the dark. Denny's was snoring. Sandy murmured something about baseball and subsided. The twins didn't have any problems. They weren't great students, but they weren't bad ones either. They were perfectly content with a succession of Bs and an occasional A or C. They were strong and fast runners and good at games. And when cracks were made about anybody in the Murray family, they weren't made about Sandy and Denny's. She left the twins room and went on downstairs, avoiding the creaking seventh step. Fortinbras had stopped barking. It wasn't the tramp this time then. Fort would go on barking if anybody was around. But suppose the tramp does come. Suppose he has a knife. Nobody lives near enough to hear if we screamed and screamed and screamed. Nobody'd care anyhow. I'll make myself some cocoa, she decided. That'll cheer me up. And if the roof blows off, at least I won't go off with it. In the kitchen, a light was already on, and Charles Wallace was sitting at the table drinking milk and eating bread and jam. He looked very small and vulnerable sitting there alone in the big old fashioned kitchen. A blonde little boy in faded blue Dr. Denton's, his feet swinging a good six inches off the floor. So now we're being introduced to Charles Wallace. Um, we had the dumb baby brother comment, but now we get a little bit more. We see that he's very little, um, but he's already in the kitchen and wait till you get these descriptions about him. We're gonna get more, I want you to add them in. Hi, he said cheerfully, I've been waiting for you. From under the table where he was lying at Charles Wallace's feet, hoping for a crumb or two, Fordenbra raised his slender dark head in greeting to Meg and his tail thumped against the floor. Ford and Bride arrived on their doorstep, a half-grown puppy, scrawny and abandoned one winter night. He was Meg's father's, he was, Meg's father had decided, part Llewellyn Setter and part Greyhound, and he had a slender, dark beauty that was all his own. Why didn't you come up to the attic? Meg asked her brother, speaking as though he were at least her own age. I've been scared stiff. Too windy up in that attic of yours, the little boy said. I knew you'd be down. I put some milk on the stove for you. It ought to be hot by now. How did Charles Wallace always know about her? How could he always tell? He never knew or seemed to care what Sandy or Denny's or Sandy's were thinking. It was his mother's mind and Meg's that he probed with frightening accuracy. Was it because people were a little afraid of him that they whispered about the Murray's youngest child, who was rumored to be not quite bright? I've heard that clever people often have subnormal children, Meg had once overheard. The two boys seem to be nice, regular children, but that unattractive girl and the baby boy certainly aren't all there. It was true that Charles Wallace seldom spoke when anybody was around, so that many people thought he'd never learned to talk. And it was true that he hadn't talked at all until he was almost four. Meg would turn white with fury when people looked at him and chuckled, shaking their heads sadly. There's an illusion there. There is another very brilliant person who did not speak until he was four years old. Does anybody know who it is? Usually when I teach this in class, I have one hand that goes, oh, I know it was Einstein. So they're comparing him um, to Einstein here, that he's, he might be brilliant, a genius. Don't worry about Charles Wallace, Meg, her father had once told her. Meg remembered it was very, very clearly because it was shortly before he went away. There's nothing the matter with his mind. He just does things in his own way and in his own time. 
I don't want him to grow up to be dumb like me, Meg had said. Oh, my darling, you're not dumb, her father answered. You're like Charles Wallace. Your development has to go at its own pace. It just doesn't happen to be the usual pace. How do you know, Meg had demanded, how do you know I'm not dumb? Isn't it because you love me? I love you, but that's not what tells me. Mother and I have given you a number of tests, you know. Yes, that was true. Meg had realized that some of the games her parents played with her were tests of some kind, and that there had been more for her and Charles Wallace than for the twins. IQ tests, you mean? Yes, some of them. Is my IQ okay? More than okay. What is it? That I'm not going to tell you. But it assures me that both you and Charles Wallace will be able to do pretty much whatever you like when you grow up to yourselves. You just wait till Charles Wallace starts to talk. You'll see how right he had been about that. Though he himself had left before Charles Wallace had begun to speak, suddenly, with none of the usual baby preliminaries us using entire sentences, how proud he would have been. You'd better check the milk, Charles Wallace said to Meg now, his diction clearer and cleaner than that of most five-year-olds. So Charles Wallace is five years old. He's speaking very clearly, and he put milk on the stove to warm up. I have a five-year-old right now at home. Some of you might know my daughter, Ruth. She's not even tall enough to turn the stove on. I'm certainly not going to let her do it. Um, she speaks pretty well, but there's a lot of times you'll ask her, what? What'd you say? Well, we're not going to have that with Charles Wallace. He speaks very clearly. You put in more than twice enough milk, Meg peered into the saucepan. Charles Wallace nodded serenely. Um, so remember, we have serenity. We saw with the mother. Serenely is another, another form of that. Calmly, he responds. I thought mother might like some. I might like what? A voice said. And there was their mother standing in the doorway. So next character, page 15, mother. We'll get a description of her in a little bit. Coco, Charles Wallace said. Would you like a liverwurst and cream cheese sandwich? I'll be happy to make you one. Does that sound like something your five-year-old might make? Mine has trouble spreading peanut butter and jelly. That would be lovely, Mrs. Murray said but I can make it myself if you're busy. No trouble at all. Charles Wallace slid down from his chair and trotted over to the refrigerator, his pajamaed feet padding softly as a kitten's. How about you, Meg? He asked, sandwich? Yes, please, she said, but no liverwurst. Do we have any tomatoes? Charles Wallace peered into the crisper. One, all right if I use it on Meg, mother? To what better use could it be put? Mrs. Murray smiled. But not so loud, please, Charles. That is, unless you want the twins downstairs, too. Let's be exclusive, Charles Wallace said. That's my new word for the day. Impressive, isn't it? Prodigious, Mrs. Murray said. Meg, come let me look at that bruise. Meg knelt at her mother's feet. The warmth and light of the kitchen had relaxed her so that her attic fears were gone. The cocoa steamed fragrantly in the saucepan. Geraniums bloomed on the window sills, and there was a bouquet of tiny yellow chrysanthemums in the center of the table. The curtains, red with a blue and green geometrical pattern, were drawn and seemed to reflect their cheerfulness throughout the room. The furnace purred like a great sleepy animal. The lights glowed with steady radiance. Outside, alone in the dark, the wind still battered against the house. But the angry power that had frightened Meg while she was alone in the attic was sub subdued by the familiar comfort of the kitchen. Underneath Mrs. Murray's chair, Fortinbras let out a contented sigh. Mrs. Murray gently touched Meg's bru bruised cheek. Meg looked up at her mother, half in loving admiration, half in sullen resentment. So uh, page 16 is where we find the next vocabulary word. We have sullen, and it's kind of like being gloomy. She's, so it's one, she's looking at her mom. Oh, I admire you so much, mom. But the other one, she kind of resents her a little bit in a gloomy way. 
it was not an advantage to have a mother who was a scientist and a beauty as well. And here's our description of mother. Mrs. Murray's flaming red hair, creamy skin and violet eyes with long dark lashes seemed even more spectacular in comparison with Meg's outrageous plainness. Meg's hair had been passable as long as she wore it tidily in braids. When she went into high school, it was cut, and now she and her mother struggled with putting it up. But one side would come out curly and the other straight, so she lo looked even plainer than before. You don't know the meaning of moderation, do you, my darling? Mrs. Murray asked. A happy medium is something I wonder if you'll ever learn. Happy medium is a phrase that's going to come up over and over again throughout the book. This is an idiom or an expression that people use um, to find the happy medium. So um, it's something right in the middle. You know, maybe she does too much of something or too little of something. She needs to find that middle ground so that she has the happy medium. We're going to hear that term again and again throughout the book and in different contexts as well. That's a nasty bruise the Henderson boy gave you. By the way, shortly after you'd gone to bed, his mother called up to complain about how badly you'd hurt him. I told her that since he's a year older and at least 25 pounds heavier than you are, I thought I was the one who ought to do the complaining. But she seemed to think it was all your fault. I suppose that depends on how you look at it, Meg said. Usually, no matter what happens, people think it's my fault, even if I had nothing to do with it at all. But I'm sorry I tried to fight him. It's just been an awful week and I'm full of bad feeling. Mrs. Murray stroked Meg's shaggy head. Do you know why? I hate being an oddball, Meg said. It's hard on Sandy and Denny's too. I don't know if they're really like everybody else or if they're just able to pretend they are. I try to pretend, but it isn't any help. You're much too straightforward to be able to pretend to be what you aren't, Mrs. Murray said. I'm sorry, Maglet. Maybe if father were here, he could help you. But I don't think I can do anything till you've managed to plow through some more time. Then things will be easier for you. But that isn't much help right now, is it? Maybe if I weren't so repulsive looking. Maybe if I were pretty like you. Mother's not a bit pretty. She's beautiful, Charles Wallace announced, slicing, slicing liverwurst. Therefore, I bet she was awful at your age. How right you are, Mrs. Murray said. Just give yourself time, Meg. Lettuce on your sandwich, mother? Charles Wallace asked. No, thanks. He cut the sandwich into sections, put it on a plate, and set it in front of his mother. Yours will be along in just a minute, Meg. I think I'll talk to Mrs. What's-It about you. Who's Mrs. What's It? Meg asked. I think I want to be exclusive about her for a while, Charles Wallace said. Onion salt? Yes, please. What's Mrs. What's It stand for? Mrs. Murray asked. That's her name, Charles Wallace answered. You know, the old shingled house back in the woods that kids won't go near because they say it's haunted? That's where they live. They? Mrs. What's It and her two friends. I was out with Fordenbra a couple day of days ago. You and the twins went to school, Meg. We like to walk in the woods. And suddenly he took off after a squirrel. And I took off after him and we ended up by the haunted house. So I met them by accident, as you might say. But nobody lives there, Meg said. Mrs. what's -It and her friends do. They're very enjoyable. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Mrs. Murray asked. And you know, you're not supposed to go off our property without permission, Charles. I know, Charles said. That's one reason I didn't tell you. I just rushed off after Fordenbrough without thinking. And then I decided, well, I'd better save them for an emergency anyhow. A fresh gust of wind took the house and shook it. And suddenly the rain began to lash against the windows. I don't think I like this wind, Meg said nervously. We'll lose some shingles off the roof, that's certain, Mrs. Murray said. But this house has stood for almost 200 years, and I think it will last a little longer, Meg. There's been many a high wind up on this hill. 
And I think that's a good spot for me to stop for this lesson because we're approaching half an hour. So I wanna make these about that, the videos to be about that long. So we're gonna pause on page 20, which is a good chunk that we have read. And I will see you for the next lesson.